construction going on, things have been done physically that I can see, you understand me? And the overall picture, right, things are hard, you understand me? But at the same time, you know, governance is not a tea party. It's a very comprehensive and very big, it's a bigger problem than solution. That's the reality. And you have to key in and understand what the problems are before you can offer a solution to it. Now, the president came and said, okay, oil subsidy is gone, right? That moment, Nigerians took advantage of it. All sorts of, all sorts of racketeering went into it, forgetting we are going, coming back to still bear the grunt of it, right? How settled are we now? Everybody, food prices is going. The Nigeria is food. We have enough food in this country, but how do we buy it? The money is not there. Because why? Everybody has, they've increased their prices. You understand? But, but what do you expect from uh, people who mm, provide their own power, provide their own water? So the moment subsidy, by that declaration, the prices of fuel for their generators went up. The prices of fuel to pump the water went up. So they are looking for how to make up for that and so they up their own food prices. You see, we, Without it, that, the cost of production will go up because some certain fundamental requirements have gone up. But I, I will put it to you that if you look at what is happening in the country now, I don't know how much percentage your, your salary has gone up, you understand me, comparative to what we are going on now. Because it's very difficult in the middle of the road, in the middle of the game, to move the goalpost. Mm. We have to sit down and plan. How do we solve this problem? You understand me? Do we, do we need enough food in circulation at a probably well subsidized prices? If we can subsidize the food than the petrol, we are going to be the winner of that at the end of the day because people, food is not important. Majority of Nigerians who want to eat, who, we, are, we should all be eating, are more than those who are thinking of buying petrol for their cars and buying petrol for their generator. Without a doubt, everyone is important. Everyone is, and you could see the president listens. I mean, you, you give that to him, he listens. I mean, okay, oh, the way he's been dealing with his cabinet members, the way he's been reacting to the public accusation and public <laughs> blasting him, he listen and take action. You know, there's some who would argue, will not yes. agree with you, they'll tell you that this is a knee-jerk approach. The president listens. Yes. And he takes actions yeah. and takes decisions. Yeah. But are his team members listening? Are they taking action as the president is taking action? Are they acting according to the president's directive or they are acting according to their political affiliations? Well, so I, that's where we need you know, to play I a love, balance. I love that question. And I'm glad you threw that to me. Fantastic question, which is, which is a fact. You understand me? The, like he said it clearly, the box stop on my table, right? And I will do what I need to do when I get it on my table. And I'm glad you said it. He always do that thing. But how efficient are the implementation? I know from here, he's a fantastic resource manager. He give that to Bolatino when there any time. He knows how to put the brains together and they function. But right now, you, you, you guys have to call them out. It's your job as well. As the media people, you have to call them out because they hold the people responsibility to give an account. The president can't give an account. That is why I, I said on your, in your studio years ago, I prefer parliamentarism of government. It's very accountable. You have to go to the parliament to face question time at least once or twice a week. So you, have, you cannot come back and tell people the same thing every week. You have to be accountable. So our ministers have to be accountable. And me speaking for Wiki, not that I know, I never seen Wiki before in my life, so I'm on the telly. But where I am today now, I could see what he's doing. I could see what he's doing. So it's like, at the end of the day, if you put them on the hot seat there, minister, please, the president's giving a directive. What are you doing about this thing? He has said we should do. But the point is that, I mean, he probably will not come because he has nothing to say at the moment, mm. or, but he has to give account to Nigerians. That is the bottom line. That, that, is, that is democracy. 
There is no short way about it. If people want to know, like you said earlier, I listened to you, you want to know how much is your part of the budget. What comes to you as a Nigerian? That is the, that is the way it should be. But you know, it will take us a while to get there. But accountability in the democracy is extremely, extremely important. So in a, in a situation where you're, you're, you're running down the road and you're seeing that things are not going right, or things are not working out the way you're planning to, at what point do you stop? Well, and redirect or restructure. At what point do you do no, that? I mean, well, one thing you should give to Nigerians, let me say it to you, right? Understand me. If you go by the account of the former government, which is our same party, right? Same party, right? That people come out now to condemn and to tell you they've done very badly, they didn't do well enough, which is now probably, a majority of people come to agree to that kind of school of thought. And if still see won the election, you understand me? It's like we are able to draw a line between personalities. I mean, like in the cabinet system of government, a change of leadership Right, even if you are doing so badly, a change of leadership, right, could sway it. I, I will give you a very known example that, that is known to, to everybody. Uh, Chamberlain, Neville Chamberlain, not your Chamberlain, <laughs> was the prime minister during the Second World War of the Conservative Party, mm. but he could not pull it together. He was so afraid of the Nazi Germany, but it was replaced not by not by election, but by internal party leadership, and Churchill came in. And I, I, I don't think in history, most people don't remember Chamberlain Neville yeah. like they do uh, Churchill. Churchill. So we, we need a general that can marshal the same kind of squad in different direction. Leadership is very key. Leadership is very, very key. And you must be willing to be a major player in that cabinet responsibility. Anything short of that, you have to leave the room. So that is reality. Okay, you, you talked about the, your desire for a yes. parliamentary system of yes. government because the uh, members of cabinet can have to give they account to. on a weekly basis. They have to. <laughs> um, but we do not have a parliamentary system of government. We have a presidential system That's of right, government. That's right, we do. And then in this case, yes. the members of the cabinet have to meet with Senate committees, I mean, yes. legislative committees, yes. practically every yes. week to give account and all that. The question is, are they not being held accountable? Are you implying that, based on that, that they are not being held accountable by the legislature? Let me, let me make a clear distinction for you, right? When you go to the parliament, the cabinet system of government, you understand me? You are a cabinet member, mm. and you are a member of parliament as well. You understand me? Yes. So, there's no running away for you. I know of so many times the parliament in Nigeria here will call ministers, they will tell them, I'm sick. Even you call an agency chairman, if she tell you she's sick, I mean, she's not in the country. Mm. But as a parliamentarian, we are in the house together. You understand me? You may go to your ministry, but you have to come back to the house. So the responsibility of you are coming, you'll probably come to the parliament in this system. To, to, to speak to them about, oh, you, because most of the time, oversight function is what they do. Yeah. It's a complete different system. Div, div, division of labor, separation of power exists. You understand me? And the humongous cost of running this system, between you and I, government is very, is a, is a very expensive business. You, you, if you run for a, for a seat, in that system, and you become a member of cabinet, you know what your goals are. It's very easy to become a team player and identify with the policy and program of your party in government. We saw it in the, in the First Republic. We saw it in the North, in the East, and in the West. These are people of very common 
background and common knowledge. They were focused on what they want to do. Mr. Bank Anthony, the, the accountability system and the checks and balances yes. that we, we desire yeah. or holding the people accountable, holding those in, in appointed offices or elected okay. offices accountable um, seem not to be working. Maybe some will say because the party system is even messed up in itself because within the parties, I mean, all the parties are basically, APC has crisis, internal party crisis, so they can't even, they, they're not holding those appointed accountable to say, hey, this is where our party, these are the promises our party made to the Nigerian people. This is what we're supposed to be doing. That is not even happening. So how do we get out of this? You, you talked about the cost of governance. Yeah. Rising cost of living is also there. Yeah. Who, would sell, who would serve the Nigerian people? You know, the point is that, one, with um, due respect to you, the political class are still minority in government. Due respect to, dis to, to disabled servants, understand me, like they say, Soja go, soja come, barracks remain. The civil servants are the fabric, are the real fabric of our society without a doubt. Mm. Right? And how much responsibility did, did they take and how much light do, do I'm sorry you, that the media take on them? Don't understand me. Look at the case of this kidnapping now. Right? We, there's a DPO in that local government, right? There is a secretary for education in that local government. You understand me? Then there's a commissioner for education in that state. Then there's a government in that state. But the, the system, the Nigerian system, is, oh, but Latin, we ask my child, oh, you understand me? And what are we driving at? We are, we, are, we are getting deluded by shifting blame from where it should be. Because what are we going to take away from the cheap work kidnapping? What, what have we learned? If you travel on the length of this length and breadth of, of this country, you see a lot of schools to be to, to be sincere. Oh, just open. You can walk in. After Chibok, right? There should be a kind of security around the schools. If you if you go to any government uh, institution, I see the requirement, they will ask you for a private schools what they want, what they need to be in place. You'll be shocked. But I believe this school. It's a government school. So we need to focus more on who and who are responsible for these things in the local government who are civil servants. You say, why, why you talk about the civil servants? You yes. said they are calling the president, uh, President, who is my child. The, that, maybe that's because we still have a central system of security system. That's it. And so that's why that call is going on there. But the other, there's also the Safe School Initiative that's yeah. been put in place. Of course. Which is also being managed from the central point of view. No, no, I don't think so, because, okay. Let it's me being managed from the central point okay. of view. Okay. From, there's a central point okay. where it's all spreading down. Okay. I mean, it was from the federal government that the Safe School Initiative was started. True. Yes, True. the states have their counterpart funding and yes. all that. But at the end of the day, the question I asked earlier was yes. this. There is a party that was elected. The, our constitution yeah, says yeah, there's yeah, a party that is elected. Yes, yes. The party can say... Mr. Bank Anthony, you've been appointed into this office yeah. to serve on the BS of our party. Of course. It's our party that will be held accountable. Yes. But if the party in itself is not together, well, how would they hold okay. those in service or in the different offices you know accountable? But, but, but to, let's go to the basic force. Your analysis are very correct. But now, I've been appointed in that office. Who will I work with? Am I going to work with... APC member or PDP member or civil servant. I'm going to work with the civil servant. You understand me? So we come with the policy. Bulk of the implementation lies with them to key in into the policy we are bringing to the table. But how are we going to manage and get progress and be successful with it? So we need to, that, that is why I say to people, National Orientation Agency, they have a lot of job to do. We need a lot of reorientation in this country. Because people look at the wrong side of things entirely. They, they don't know where to look into. Because if after the Chibok issue, we still have something like this happening, then we should all, all look ourselves in the eye and say we blame each other. Mm. What are the basic things that, lack, that, that, is, that are really lacking in those areas? Security, if you, I, I, I'm not calling them, but I'm telling if you go to that school, Understand me. You will see how porous most schools are, most government schools are. You can just walk in, in there, and nobody will stop you. 
I mean, it's, it's very porous. After Chibok, there was, should have been the, a minimum standard of security that local government in, the, in each areas should provide for their schools. It's very, very important. But do, do the local government have the security? Every, the, every local government chairman has even have security votes. Okay. In a scenario, like, did you know that the mayor of London, right? Mm. The mayor of any city, the chief of police reports to the mayor of London, not to the prime minister. He's in charge of them. The chief of police in, in the city. London. Yes, reports to the mayor of London, not to the prime minister. Not to, but, but to the, they are the mayor of those cities. Okay. Right? The, the, the more the governor should understand it that, and give the local government the necessary power and what they have, what they need to, to, to implement their functions, the better they are going to go. Mr. Bakanto, you see, that conversation again comes down to where a lot of people have gone to right now recently, yes. saying calling for state police to give room for the governors and the local governments even to get their own police so that they can say, for our schools, this yeah. is what we are doing. Yeah. Lagos State, for instance, has a security trust fund. Yeah. Funding the police, funding the other security mm -hmm. apparatus, as the mm -hmm. case may be. But even at that, Lagos, wouldn't Lagos be happier to have its own police system it, so that they can structure it the way it, it works it, for them? Lagos still has uh, the neighborhood watch. They fund the police through uh, Lagos State uh, Security Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. They have the last, they have the last man as well. You understand me? But a police, a state police, like is a welcome development across board. But you know something, we need to put things in place. So we don't end up back to square one. You understand me? Mm. Because we need to know who are they reporting to. You understand? Like, like I said to you, like the mayor of London, we, we have three police in London City alone. Yeah. London, the, the, the British Transport Police, Metropolitan Police, and City Police. And the mayor of London is the person, not the Prime Minister, they report to. So we need to understand that, that for the lack for, for us to for us to limit the abuse of power, right? I will definitely say we need a state police to function for the benefit of our people and our security. It's utmost important that we have that. Mm. You understand? My, my colleague Aya has a couple of questions. Aya. Oh. Hey. Well, thank you, uh, Nyota. Mr. Mr. Bank Anthony, <laughs> it's good to see you again. Good morning. You know, <laughs> le, le, good morning. Let me, let me yeah. begin, let me try to coagulate one or two issues together and use it to ask you this question. You talked about the appointments of Mr. President okay. and uh, the fact that, uh, you know, yeah. those people, they were selected for one thing or the other and all of that. You know, one of those appointments is that of the Ministers of Defense. The Minister of Defense is, a former gov is the former governor of uh, uh, Jigawa State. The Minister of State for Defense yeah. is a former governor of Zamfara State. Now, they understand how states run, how security apparatus run in states. And yet, since 2014, as you said, almost all through the eight years of the previous administration and into this administration less than one year, we have had spates of kidnappings in tens, in some cases in hundreds. So the president has promised that anyone who doesn't deliver, he's going to sack. Do you see anything happening in that regard anytime soon? Definitely. I can assure you, if you can't deliver, you have to leave. And to go to the issue of defense, you see, security is not really defense. Let's make that clear. We have security agencies in, the, in, the, in our country, at least three different or four different ones. Then we have the police, you understand me? And the, what we need more is intelligence gathering. That is, that is what is lacking. That is what is just really like. And are you suggesting, Mr. Bankan, just a second, just one second. Are, are you suggesting yes. that okay. the kidnappings, the abductions in Borno State of 200 women, internally displaced persons, the abductions of almost 300 pupils in Kaduna State, and the abduction of about 15 or so we hear in Sokoto State, there was no intelligence to the effect. And they happened so easily, and no well, one noticed and no one said anything. Well, I'm very glad with your comment that it happened so easily. You understand me? So are, are you telling us, are you telling viewers that definitely there was negligence, that they, there, there was a report that they did not follow? 
You understand? Because what I said clearly, we have a problem with intelligence gathering, you understand, or, and, or, or implementation. Because, because like you said, 200 people moving at the same time, right? It's not... I, I want to be clear, my, my, Mr. Ban Mr. The, Bankanti, I, I want to understand. You said yes, something sir. very, very critical the other time, that there is a DPO in every local government yes. area in Nigeria. We are also aware course, that there is a DSS right. official. There, there is a DSS official in every local government in Nigeria. So when you say there is a problem that's with right. intelli intelligence gathering, on who does that bulk of intelligence stop? I don't think that is the president. Some people, it is some people's job to gather intelligence, and some other people's job to act on that intelligence. So what is missing? You, 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 you are just you, you just. Help me to answer my question. You understand me? DSS claimed they have offices in all local governments, right? How, how serious and how equipped are those offices, right? Maybe you need to bring down the director of DSS to explain to us the way they work. DSS is there, police is there. You understand me? SSS is there. Are they coordinating together? You understand me? Are they coordinating together in, in those local governments? So these things, like I said to you, the president cannot be held responsible. By the end of the day, I said it, the box stop on my table. How efficient are our local chairmen, the governors? Because going back to what you said about the defense minister here and there, their former governors, they, they understand state security. They do. But the reality is that, you understand me, you, you will act on something. And this is a country where we don't even have enough resources. How many policemen do we have right now in, the, in Nigeria? How many are the SSS officers we have in Nigeria? How many could we put in a local government to safeguard for security purposes? Some things need serious reviewing, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And these are the things they ought to recommend to their superiors and up, upwardly to the table of Mr. President. Because everything has cost management involvement in them. So for me, right, I'm not saying or try to put this agency down, but it is clear, very clear, that those security agencies are not coordinating very well enough. Mm -hmm. Because this is becoming like a conspiracy. You understand me? Kidnapping in one part of the country all the time. You understand me? And, I, I, and let me add something here, please, uh, Ayo. I met a senior military officer who said to me what they've been doing regarding security, regarding oil theft and everything. Now, you understand, but there's a restriction on them to come out and speak to it. But they're looking at a way that the government has invested so much in security, and I believe that common that defense as well, in protecting our natural resources. So we need to understand that in the area where, where I mean, defense, they need to do something. I'm not defending them as ministers or, or as my party member, no. But the issue of security, you understand me, and safety, you understand me, we are talking with the security agencies. That's okay. With their 40. Even, even the National Civil Service, civil, is it civil defense as, as well? They are part of the security agency now. So we have more than enough. Right. Yes, that you're right, uh, Mr. Bank. Play an active role. Yeah, we have quite a number of security agencies, more than ten, even up to thirteen or so. In uh, you know, at, at my last count. But and I mean, you have also said that there there is a difference between security and uh, and defence. Perhaps that's some semantics on the number of people might say. But then the issue here, is, I mean, you've talk, also talked about us protecting our, 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 our natural resources, the human resources. Uh, some people will argue with you is far more important than anything else. The fact that children are being abducted and taken into parts that are just absolutely unimaginable. It's scarring their minds and scarring their capacity to be productive for this nation in the near or far future. Now, what do you see missing and what needs to be done urgently? There are those who would say, okay, we had uh, Senator Obanikoro uh, last week, sometime last week, and he was talking about the fact that, look, the people who are involved in some of the, he, he, he insinuated that there are people who and issues involved in these kidnappings that if they were made known, it will make 
it will, that Nigeria will burn. Those are his words. And we've also heard governors, serving governors, tell us on this program, in, in this country, that there are powerful forces behind some of these insecurity issues we had. We have had ministers say the same thing. So is it that there are some people that are above the law? Because these issues have, have traversed governments. This is the third government that is dealing with this particular issue. 2014, it was the Jonathan government. The 2015 to 2023, it was the Buhari government. All kinds of kidnappings. And now, the Tinubu government is dealing with the same thing. Is it that these issues are, are escaping us, or there are some forces too powerful for governments to handle, in your opinion? Well, thank you very much. You know something? I mean, when you work with someone, you know their character and, and what have you. And... I, I'm, I'm bold to tell you that the current president we have now, as well as Tinumbu, you understand me? I don't think, maybe that mentality we had for so many years, that when you come on a program to speak to Nigerians, and you make a certain claim or allegation about the security of this country, about what you know, and what you can give as an account, the, the, the security should call you in to, to, to come and help. Have they done that? Why would they start doing that? When governors are making statements like that, or ministers are, ministers are, are making statements like that, and they just make it and they go away. What are we talking about here? How do we solve the problem? You understand? We need to be more inclusive. Intelligence gathering is, not, is beyond the security uh, corridor. It's beyond it. Are you People saying, Mr. Bankan, just one second. Are you saying that the security agencies, yes. are you saying security agencies are not aware of these issues that have been raised over the years? You said something now, Mr. Makide, and let me quickly make one correction, right? Without a doubt, I mean, the security and the safety of Nigerians' life is more ahead of what we call our resources, because it's meant for them. Let me move forward now. You understand me? If they are aware... If the security agency are aware, where are the results now in 10 years or in 12 years? So if somebody can come here, you said the minister came here, a former governor came here, and they said clearly what we know, you understand me? Anywhere in the world, right? What, what you talk about even community police intelligence gathering? It's the people that come up with what they know, what they see. That's part of it. That, that is the way problems are solved. Because those officers are not there at the scene of the crime, but people are there. People know something. What do you know? What do you see? Neighbor to neighbor, tell us. We need to build that confidence in our people. that like they can relate with the officers and help the community. But anything short of that, we are just going to be groping in the dark. That is reality. We need an internal arrangement with our people to let them know and you know something? We are part of this together. It's all inclusion. Right? Wearing a uniform does not make you superior to a civilian in Nigeria. You go to them for help, they will help you. Mm. That is my own take. Mr. McAntony, yes. you see, again, you, you've taken this back again to the people. Yes. But the people will tell you that they employed you. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. necessarily you. That's right. And they, they voted for you. Yes. They are paying you. The yeah. taxes are mm -hmm. used to service yeah. you. So you're there to serve the people. Yeah. And you should be able to talk to the people. That's Some right. will say that one of the biggest challenges that leadership has in Nigeria is the fact that they don't talk to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. They feel like if we talk to Nigerians, that's a problem. Yeah. Can that be re re remedied? That is where, that, that's why I said to you, the National Retention Agency has a lot of work to do. You understand me? Everywhere in the world that is civilized, like you said, you voted for them, you employ them, you do, but at the same time, the people see play a very, very significant role in getting things done. Go to so many landmark cases across. You need in the community. What do you see? What do you know? What do you know? Of, what do you know of this man? Like we say, like we say in my Yoruba town, your son is not a watchman. He's bringing clothes in. All these little, little things are things that they are, the, they are very basic, but they are very important. You, you cannot ignore to come to an area and say, oh, let's assume an accident happened on the, on the express road, right? Hey, people must have seen something. Your manner of approach and connection to them will make them 
come out and tell you what they have seen. That is the reality. People snitch on their husband, on their wife, on their kids. Mm. If they believe it's for the public good. Because the moms are speaking inwards and looking inwards, the better for us. The government can do everything for us. Okay, so do the people have that confidence to talk to the government or its agencies? You know what? Uh, I'm, I'm glad now we are in this world of the Gen Z and the millennial and everything, you understand me? Where everything is being said, wrongly or rightly. You understand me? If I live here now, they can abuse me a thousand times. <laughs> you understand me? So it's not so. So there's a way. You see, if you if you can reorient if you can reorient them in that direction, you understand me? I mean, there's a way we can talk to our government. There's, there must be meditation between the people and the government. Right now, we have at least visible young people in government, in the state and in the federal level. You understand me? And they are key part of this government. So they have a role to play there. So you cannot say, okay, now they are all old people. They don't know what is going on. Everybody's on Twitter, Andrew. They are social media. You understand me? If you go there, you try to say what they abuse you, you, you will leave. You understand? Because you, 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 you can never win the war with them. But this, that same medium can be used in a more positive manner. They have been aggressive. I know there's a lot of aggression in our people, without a doubt. There's a lot of aggression, but of anger in people. But you know what? That is not the point. But people should stop inciting with all kind, all manner of languages, of action. We are here, so we know where to go. Like President said, he's throwing jabs to the neighbor the other time. He's going to be here for the next uh, uh, three and a half years now. There's nothing you can do about it. Meet me at the polling uh, booth at the next time. So let's work together. Let's build this country together. Let's see the benefit of it together. Just to let you go, you, you know, you're this thing about let's work together, let's build together, yes. let's see the benefits together. Yes. There, there are those who will say, while you're calling for the people to show their patriotism, and I alluded to that as well, Let's see the patriotism of those in public, in public office, the politicians, their appointees, and all of that. What advice would you give to those in office and then the Nigerians, while they're telling Nigerians to be patriotic, well, to you know, love this nation? You know what, what, what advice would you give Nigeria's to them? Patriotic. Nigerians, including the government, the people in power, people in office, it's everybody. It's, it's, not, it's not people that are not in government. No, we are all Nigerians. And the last time, as you said, the president has cut down is entering right to 20 and the wife to five. And it's, it's going to be a tall order if you understand governance. It will, lead, will the president tell his doctor he cannot go with him? You understand me? Or tell the media he cannot go with him? So it's a major sacrifice if you, if you understand what I'm trying to tell you. Because, I mean, anything lack of the standard procedure of government to, that they operate with, if anything should happen, they will, they, will be, they will be held responsible. So about Nigeria being patriotic, I'm not excluding the ruling class from it at all. Mm. We all have to be patriotic for this, for the sake of this country to move forward. You know, talking about that cutting down of his entourage, his travel entourage, yes. the last time the president traveled, there was a lot of conversation around his two sons who are there, part of that entourage. And then... Even in the protocol order, they were standing you know before the ministers. You know that was I've, 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 read, I've read a lot of stuff about it, to be sincere, but let me take it on a personal level. I'm serious, and I'm being extremely honest. Let me take it on a personal level, right? How well you know people. I can tell you something for free about the president, right? And I'm not here making any... I'm not singing his praises or making anything for him. It is a guy that... That young boy here you are looking at, right? I will tell you, he was so deprived of his father for so many years. For so, so many years. You understand me that? Even as a primary school, it was a boarding school. You understand me? Then from that moment, you're boarding school, you know, you lose, your, you lose your son or your daughter. You understand me? So, I mean, if so... the president, now, you know something, it has a window. To spend time. Okay, he left England, he came back to Nigeria, he went straight into government, right? From there, he has been very busy, you understand? So I'm talking from a personal point of view because my old son told me, you left me, you left me when I was one plus, mm. and the gap still exists till today. Okay. Mr. 
Bank Anthony, who, who really likes to let, we have to let it go thank here at this so point. Much. I want to thank you so much, Mr. Tune Bank Anthony is a former director I general of the Sports I Commission have Lagos. Have <laughs> and a Harvard well, alumni right. and thank also a friends. member of the All Progressives Congress. Thank you, so thank you again for coming in this morning. Welcome. Let's thank hope you that so you're able much. to make up time with your son. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, at this point in time, we will just, uh, as Aya will say, segue into the business segment with Amy John Mekwa. Thank you so much, uh, Nelta. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Business Morning on Sunrise Daily. It's time to do uh, about 30 minutes of business. We start from the global space. Oil prices extended last week's losses on Monday on concerns about slow demand in China, although lingering geopolitical risk surrounding the Middle East and Russia limited the decline. Brent features fell 55 cents. That's about 0.7 percent. So we see that uh, both that's uh, Brent and WTI uh, for the U.S. and uh, for a country like Nigeria are down 0.7% each at $81. Last week we did about $83, uh, but for, we start this week with $81.53 a barrel, while uh, WCI has dropped also to $77.44 a barrel. Now let's look at the factors driving it on Friday data, uh, job data from the U.S., came out and it showed uh, growth accelerated in February, but a rise in the unemployment rate and moderation in wage gains kept an anticipated June interest rate cut from the Federal Reserve on the table. Of course, uh, the economic activities also reflect on the demand for oil. Then we go to China, where the economic growth target for 2024, about 5%, that's raised some dust early last week, and uh, many analysts are calling that ambitious without much a stimulus. On the supply side, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, that's OPEC, and it allies OPEC plus, uh, Russia is included there, have agreed this month to extend voluntary oil output. And we know that will squeeze demand and increase price. So those are the factors driving oil prices this morning. Going to the grain space, Chicago soybeans rose with the market climbing into its highest levels in almost three weeks on short covering, although expectations of ample South American supplies are likely to keep a lid on the prices. We've been discussing this since last week. Uh, let's look at the numbers right there. Wheat is down 0.1% at $5.37 a bushel. Soybeans is on the flip side, gained 0.3% at $11.87 for three quarter of a bushel. It's been about $11 now for, I think, about two weeks. Talking about soybean corn, however, dropped 0.3% to $4.38 for half a bushel. Now, let's see the drivers. Now, the U.S. Department of Agriculture slightly lowered its forecast for Brazil's soybean crop further on Friday, but its outlook was above many private estimates. USDA, that's the U.S. Department of Agriculture, pegged Brazil's harvest at 155 million metric tons compared with its February estimate of 156. And this is uh, lower or higher than what analysts expected, about 152 million. The agency says that harvest results in the state of Parama and poor weather conditions in Sao Paulo were offset by favorable conditions. For wheat, the USDA, uh, in its monthly report, lowered its forecast of 2023-2024. U.S. wheat exports to 710 million bushels from 725 million. Hefty global grain supplies and strong competition for export business dragged down corn and soybean prices to multi-year late last month. But expectations of abundant supplies may have been factored into that. Now let's come to Nigeria and see some of the things happening and reactions. Uh, first of all, there's the Director General of the National Pension Commission, that's PENCOM, Mrs. Aisha Dahir Umar, has denied that uh, the that PENCOM is owing or was owing federal government retirees arrears of pensions, as well as insinuations that pension fund administrators as PFAS are not fulfilling their obligations to retirees with regards to access 
to their retirement savings. In a statement shared with the media, Mrs. Dahir Umaru emphasizes that apart from the fact that Pencom is not a bank and does not warehouse or manage pension funds, the federal government did not take a loan of 10 trillion naira from the commission. She denied claims that Pencom was owing federal government retirees arrears of pensions as well as insinuations that pension fund administrator was not fulfilling uh, their obligation. And according to her, investment by the PFAS in, is in securities of the federal government of Nigeria, and they are not loans or, which has been erroneously portrayed, but investments in securities through bonds and treasury bills as approved by the relevant government agencies. Still in Nigeria, the Independent Petroleum Producers Group, IPPG, is happy with the recent executive order signed by the President, President Tinubu, uh, aimed at revitalizing investments in Nigeria's oil and gas sector. Remember that reform was signed last week. The order, which includes the introduction of value-adding fiscal incentives for investments in upstream, non-associated gas uh, development, midstream infrastructure, and deep water assets, streamlining the industry's contracting process are measures which, according to the group, are pivotal to the future of the industry and have been recommended by the industry for many years. IPPG believes uh, when properly implemented, the measures will lead to reduced project costs, faster project execution timelines, reduction of waste, among other benefits. And still another reaction, the suspension of the expatriate employment levy, the EEL, has been receiving some positive responses. One of it is from the chief executive officer of the Center for Promotion of Private Enterprises, Dr. Muda Yusuf, who believes that the gesture is a demonstration of the fact that the Tinubu administration is responsive, democratic, and inclusive in its governance process. Moving forward, the CPP highlights the National Content Act and the Presidential Executive Orders 3 and 5, which focuses on localization of procurement and service opportunities, as well as the extant laws and regulations within the framework of the Nigeria Immigration Act and the Expatriate Quota Handbook that squarely addresses the outcomes contemplated in the EEL. According to Dr. Yusuf, the next step should be to strengthen the institutional and regulatory effectiveness in the Ministry of Interior and Immigration Service to ensure compliance and enforcement and not necessarily having a new law. Well, let's settle on that for a bit. And um, we have uh, joining us to, to share his thoughts and findings. The Chief Executive Officer of Business Day, Mr. Frank Aibogun, uh, joins us virtually from Lagos. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Aibogun. Good morning. Good morning. So obviously, um, the President is receiving applause now because he has reacted. We've seen man discuss this. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of participants, especially in the private sector, uh, talk about the EEL, and we see him responding. But we have to remember that it's a suspension and not that the EEL has been uh, totally halted. So, but uh, what, what do you think, apart from the fact that it's good that the president is listening and acting on it, what do you see, what are some of the sentiments around the EEL from your findings? Well, thank you. Uh, I think from uh, the get-go, um, the response to the levy was uh, negative. Uh, it was stopped at, at a time that Nigeria was um, keen to promote inward investment flows. It, it, it wasn't the right time to begin to tinker with the cost of um, bringing personnel into the country by investors. Truth is, um, when you get capital into the country, often it comes with specialized uh, skill. Um, and and uh, that, is, that is just basic. And it was stopped that uh, the timing was, was really inauspicious. And thankfully, the president has, um, has um, you know, suspended it. We believe that the suspension is a first step to complete abrogation of the levy. Hmm. So what do you say to what uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf says? He says that we already have laws that are taking care of this. We have the National Content, Content Act. We have the Presidential Executive Orders 3 and 5. So perhaps... Um, this is already taken care of, or do you think there should be a bit of an adjustment 
through existing laws, you know, to help uh, in this area that the president is concerned about? I see absolutely no rationale for any um, additional law, as uh, Dr. Yusuf has said. I also don't believe there is any motivating factor uh, for tinkering with the existing laws. In fact, I think the existing laws are quite burdensome. And if you ask me, it is even taking out some of the existing laws rather than tinkering with them or increasing them. A better implementation, you recall, for instance, that uh, the uh, one of the executive orders that you referred to earlier, um, which the president signed uh, last week, uh, relates to implementation of the Nigerian on Local Content Act in the oil sector. It's been abused um, and, and has become a disincentive for investment. So the government, uh, or the president, has rightfully um, adjusted that law to ensure that uh, implementation uh, of the law is forthright, transparent, and that it delivers on the goals of, of Nigeria. So do, do you think, Saibo Kuna, this speaks to perhaps some of the, the perspective that Nigeria does not lack the laws. It's actually the implementation of the law. Uh, uh, that should be the area to be looked at. I think, I think, I think you're quite right. Um, Nigeria doesn't lack adequate laws. It is in the implementation that we have consistently failed. So anything that government can do to ensure transparent, speedy implementation of existing laws will be useful in attracting further investment into the country. On the other hand, would you say the country is doing enough to get skills in some of these really technical areas which expatriates uh, are looked for? Would you say there's an intentionality, perhaps from the private sector, you know, to get those skill sets? I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure um, why there is this obsession with um, imported skills into the country. I, I don't see how that's a problem today. I look around um, and I don't see that problem. When you go to the big uh, foreign companies uh, in Nigeria, you're likely going to find that um, the foreign um, uh, component of, of the staff is uh, no more than two, three percent, sometimes even less. So I, 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 am, I am at a loss at, as to how this has suddenly become priority uh, for us in Nigeria. Yes, it is true. Uh, as Dr. Adishno uh, said last uh, Thursday or Wednesday, uh, Nigeria should ensure improved educational facilities in-house so that our people don't go out. But most importantly, Nigeria should be going out to look for quality skill to bring to the country to speed up development. All right, let's switch a bit and talk about this expectation from Goldman Sachs saying that uh, in 12 months, they expect the Naira to go for 1,200, which obviously is an appreciation, you know, compared to where we are at this moment. Do you agree with this going by the trend that we see? I mean, we're going to do a trend of uh, a movement last week, but do, do you see us here in 12 months? Is it even worth celebrating having uh, a dollar go for 1,200 in 12 months? I don't think it's worth celebrating. Let's dismiss that very quickly. But the other part, and which is perhaps the more important, is the fact that um, if you read the Goldman Sachs uh, report completely, you would find, or fully, you'll find that um, many of these forecasts and expectations are contingent upon certain things happening. So we shouldn't clap when, as it, as it is, we haven't done enough of the things that Goldman Sachs hopes uh, uh, if we do, would lead to an appreciation of the of the Naira. But also, most importantly, about the same time that Goldman Sachs was uh, 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 issuing his report, the Economist Intelligence Unit issued its March report on Saturday uh, saying that there was a high probability of the Naira reaching 2,000 by the end of the year. So um, I don't think it's time for for, 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 for chorus at all, if you, if you look at... Um, what we need to do, a lot we are not doing. I mean, take for instance, uh, Egypt, um, you know, sold assets to UAE to the value of $24 billion in the last two weeks. $24 billion. And the Egyptian pound has rallied from 70 
to 49 pounds to the dollar as we speak this morning. So you can see such significant appreciation if we do the right thing. The central bank is working on demand, just ensuring that um, um, it squeezes liquidity, that it um, offers um, improved um, uh, yields to investors to come in. And on the back of that, we hear last week a uh, high risk that we have probably gotten half of what uh, we got the whole of last year suddenly uh, in, in uh, one month in Nigeria. So, so that's good. But there's a lot of work that we need to do, a lot of work. Um, we need to deal with the supply side. So far, nothing is happening um, to the supply side. And, and, and I mean, for instance, significant increase in oil and gas production. I'm not sure anyone expected that about a year after this government came in, we will still be at the levels of oil and gas production that we are today. That is very, very poor. We need more dollars, not just you know, dollars that we're going cap in hand begging. We need dollars that we end legitimately. We also need to increase food supply. We need to increase food supply and reduce food insecurity. And simple basic things by just grading roads to farming belts in Nigeria to ensure that, you know, harvest can come to the market. That way we can reduce the about 40% of, uh, of, of farm waste that we suffer, suffer today without necessarily increasing the land that you cultivate. So that's one. Secondly, we need to curb insecurity. We need, of course, to improve power supply significantly. There cannot be increased production without power supply. I, I, I am at a loss why this is taking so long to happen. Perhaps we now must begin to question the competence of the power minister. Uh, I hear complain all the time, but I see no policy trust. I see no policy initiative aimed at improving power generation and power distribution. And back to the point you made earlier about skill. We need to improve um, you know, uh, quality of education in Nigeria so that we can cut the amount of money that we are spending abroad to educate our children. We need to reduce significantly the about $1 billion in health tourism spent in countries like India and other countries by vastly enhancing quality of healthcare delivery in Nigeria. And there are a number of other things. These are just simple, basic things. I think the government needs to stop playing politics and begin to do what it needs to do to ensure that this economy can actually get back on its feet. Yeah, well, a long list there, unfortunately. And none of that, no, no item on that list is new. It's just been there for a long time. But let's talk about the power, for instance. And I, I know the Minister of Power, uh, we had uh, sanctioning these goals. Uh, uh, but as, as you said, that hasn't changed anything. Perhaps we, we should look at the state governors. We see what Abia State Governor has done. Uh, we know that the, there's been a reform of the Electricity Act to allow state uh, governments to uh, participate more about generation and uh, distribution. Uh, but do you think they are waking up to that, talking about state governments? Well, I mean, uh, that's another area of failing. Um, many people suggest that uh, perhaps uh, the uh, tier of government to watch more closely uh, the, uh, the state governments, and I think I agree with that. I think um, what has happened in Abia, even if we cannot, um, in all honesty, attribute this to the work that um, a good governor like Governor Oti has done. I mean, geometric has been on the, on the, on, on the table for, for, for many years. Um, and um, it's good that it is finally um, uh, 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 on stream and providing um, power to the people. I think the governments can do a lot. Uh, we were hearing a lot of noises from a uh, Katna state government, from uh, Lagos state government, from uh, Edo state government. But that's it. Um, in Lagos, for instance, uh, I think it's a pity that Lagos is not doing much more than it should do. The um, uh, law or the proposed law to set up a, an electricity market in, uh, in Lagos is stuck at the State House of Assembly for almost a year now. That's a disgrace. All right, uh, Mr. Abogun, uh, we, we certainly do hope that especially state governments will take up uh, that responsibility, especially now they have the 
power to do that. They've been empowered by the law. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and perspective with us this morning, Chief Executive Officer of Business Day. All right, now let's head to the market. Uh, yes, of course, uh, we did see that over the weekend, and we, Mr. Ibokin just talked about it. Uh, Goldman Sachs saying that in 12 months, they expect that the Naira will go for about 1,200 to a dollar. Let's take a little bit uh, of walk back and see how the Naira fared last week, uh, looking at uh, the movement on NAFEX. Let's have the Naira first before we go uh, back to there. So in NAFEX, on Monday, on Monday, there you have it. Uh, the Naira gained 19 Naira, uh, 77 Kabo, to close at 1,597 1, Naira, 96 Kabo. This was on Monday. This was uh, it closed with on Monday after it gained. So there was an appreciation last week, Monday, 19 Naira, 70. Seven Kobo. For Tuesday, uh, there was the shortage of funds, obviously continued, and then NAFEX weakened and lost almost all it gained on Monday. That's for Tuesday, and closed at 1,566 Naira, 43 Kobo. And then uh, uh, by Wednesday, there was another drop of about 42 Naira, 6 Kobo for Wednesday, and then it closed at 1,608 Naira, 49 Kobo. Uh, that was for Wednesday. Uh, so we had a gain on Monday, but Tuesday, Wednesday, it depreciated. And then uh, for Thursday, there was another drop, but not so much. Two Naira, 65 Kobo was shaved off the Naira, this is on the NAFEX window, to close at 1,611 Naira, 14 Kobo. So most of last week, we were around 1,600 uh, Naira. For Friday, which is what it closed to it for the week, there was another drop on the Naira. It dropped 4 Naira, 71 Kobo to close at 1,615 Naira, 85 Kobo. So um, in spite of uh, all this effort, and of course last week, the CBN did say that there was an increase in remittances uh, inflow into the, uh, into the FX market. But in spite of that, yes, this... This is it. So that's it. On Monday, there was a gain. On Tuesday, there was a drop. Uh, gained 19 Naira. Dropped more than 18 Naira on Tuesday. On Wednesday, it dropped about 42 Naira. Uh, that was a whole lot for Wednesday. Then Thursday, uh, there was another depreciation. That was slight. Uh, 2 Naira, 65 Kobo. And then on Friday, it was 4 Naira to close at 1,615 Naira, 85 Kobo. This is on the NAFEX window. These numbers are gotten from uh, Access Bank data. This is their trading number. So um, we know it's an official number. So this is what the market, the Naira, is opening with this morning at NAFEX, 1,615 Naira, 85 Kobo. And this is in spite of a lot of effort. But I guess, as Mr. Ibogun said, perhaps the government should also look at the supply side of FX into the country, then uh, the squeeze in the FX market might have more relief. So just before we go, just before we head back to Sunrise, let's do the market numbers and see uh, how the NGX uh, fed last week. It was positive. Last week was positive. Good news all through. 2.61% uh, is what the market gained at the NGX and sustained that 101,000 level that it recovered last week. Equity cap went up to 57.293. Remember this in addition of Transcore Power. They brought 1.8 trillion Naira to the market last week, to the market cap, and even surpassed that by the close of trade last week. A good one um, for that company. And um, let's look at uh, all the, the counters for last week for the NGX. There you have it. Uh, the volume was up more than 14%. Value, 218.7% added uh, right there. We know that we started the week at about 55 trillion Naira and closed at 57 trillion Naira. Uh, so even uh, with the 1.8 brought in by Transcorp Power, we also had some positive movements in the market. More than 51,000 deals were closed in the market at the NGX last week. But when we look at the sectors, uh, there's a lot of red right there. Banking dropped 1.40. Consumer goods also went down. Uh, industrial goods uh, was able to stay up there, 1.50. And then insurance, a lot of those penny stocks, uh, which had started gaining uh, the interest of investors, seem to have lost it 
profit taking on it last week. Oil and gas is staying quiet for about three weeks now. It's staying quiet. I wonder what is going to bring that uh, counter back up. Top gainers were Transco Power, gained a lot, started with 240 Naira and close over 300 at the close of trade last week. Julie PLC, International Energy, also was uh, right there. Then for the top losers, Guinness, ETI, NEM, Insurance uh, were there. For the smaller market, that's the NESD, it was a negative at the close of trade for the NESD. There you have it, more than 5% in the red, and the market cap stood at 1.46 trillion naira after five days of trade. Uh, the activity charts right there had value uh, in the red, volume in the red, 80 deals and 13 stocks traded for a total of uh, that. So that's how the market looks like. Uh, the good thing is we are starting a new week, so uh, if you see an opportunity, you might want to uh, take that opportunity and perhaps uh, make some good out of it, maybe make some money out of it. It's all up to you. But we know that the federal government is aggressive about um, raising funds uh, and mopping up. The CBN is very aggressive about mopping up inflation. So we see the yields at the fixed income market looking really attractive. Uh, certainly 1 p.m. will give you that. We still have tomorrow also. We can also talk about that. Uh, that's what's going on in the fixed income space. Yields are going up right there, getting close to inflation rate, making it attractive for investors. You may be interested. All you have to do is stick right here on Business Morning or Business Incorporated. For now, it's back to the Sunrise Daily Studio. But let me correct an impression. We didn't lose 2023 election because we didn't work. No. That is why I'm here to appreciate all of you. We are more than this. You are my heroes. You did very well. Another one that I need to say to you. We did not lose 2023 because some people within the party chose to do other things. No, that's not why we lose. That's not why we lost. No. No. What they did in 2023, they did not do it because of Jando, because they have issues with Jando. No. It has been their style every election circle. That's it. That's, it has been a way of life of them every election circle. In 2019, the same group declared to support ADP as against PDP candidates. 2019. Have you heard about it? Yeah, Jando was not in PDP at that time. 2017, for local government election, they worked for Labour. Same PDP leaders in Lagos State. 2015, they did the same thing. Every election cycle. So, what happened in 2020 wasn't because Jando did this to us or Jando wasn't. No, that has been their stalking trade. Okay, hey. they use the excuse. And that is why today we are standing on our feet yes, to say no. if you don't want to do PDP, just carry your bag and go. Hey, It's about time to look at the like minds. Yes. For those who have declared for labor, they should stay there. Yeah. For those who have worked for APC, they should enjoy it. Yes. The message I just need to give to all of us, it is very simple. 
Let them carry their baggage and give us a loan. Today, I still have the flag of PDP in my hand. And I'm not dropping it. Welcome back from that business segment. And a lot of things are happening today. Yes, we talked about today. Um, one of the meetings that's going to happen today will be the Minister of Power meeting with members, um, agencies under that, that ministry. And then also the president is going to Niger State. I'm trying to get exactly uh, what he's going to do. Yes, he's going to Niger State to commission some agri imputes that have been acquired by the government and then some other projects as well. Among the things that have already happened is the renaming of the airport in Mina after the president. Um, all of that's going to be happening today in Niger State, in Mina. The president is going to Niger. He's expected in Niger State. I don't know if he's already arrived, but one of those that was expected today, while we're still waiting for a guest, one of those that was expected today in the studio, ah, uh, finally arrived, and she's going to tell us exactly what happened. Ayo was also wondering what happened to her, but Mokwe, talk to like, her. <laughs> it looks like our guest, too, is a bit uh, held up in that particular situation, Auntie. It's, it's still very difficult to say what has happened within the FCT, um, yeah. um, especially when you look at all of the arteries leading into the city this morning. Uh, but it does appear that something unusual Mm. Um, has happened. A journey that would take maximum, I mean, even on a really, really bad day, 40 to 50 minutes, on a really bad day, I mean, you must always make provision for Monday morning, rush yes, hour, ex extra, extra, you know, minutes. It took uh, at least an hour, 20 minutes to make it this morning. So um, it's been, <laughs> I do not know what is going on, but I do, I, I do believe that the minister of the FCT will have to have a handle on not just law and order within the FCT, but also on traffic management. That's mm. something that has to be a priority area. 
I really do wish that I had to, because I, sadly I was the one driving and you cannot be doing... No, no, you, 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 can't, know, you have you can't to take that risk, yes. <laughs> driving. But on passing a lot of the bus stops uh, that one was, you know, going through this morning, you could see the disappointment and the anxiety on people's faces who were waiting to access public transport, uh, which wasn't forthcoming. Mm. Um, as um, I, I think this has come with years of speaking with governors, you know, who will talk about how, you know, there ought to be public transport. Looking at a lot of us, we were individuals, single individuals in our vehicles. And if these individuals had the ability to merge, we obviously will be able to take right more people. And all yeah, of that, yeah. Exactly. It, it certainly will, you know, be lighter on the roads. But looking at all of these and when I mean there were lots of people, including students who ought to have been in school by 8 o'clock, still stranded at bus stops this morning, it was traffic unusual. That's what I can I, I, I do. I, I, I think I, saw, I caught a bit of it, mm -hmm. but I saw it at a distance. I saw the build-up at a distance and took a turn off. Yeah. So I had to, instead of getting to the Area 1 roundabout, which, which is like the... The meeting point, the convergence yeah. of a lot of the roads at that area at one point. I had to turn off at the stadium. But as I was going at the stadium to come out at Garaki area, I noticed that those who were coming from the city gate into um, towards stadium going to area one, some of them were either going forward and some were turning back. So it was like on one lane, people were going back and forth. A lot of way. madness. A lot of madness was on that. You know, point. indiscipline so as I, well. Because the I, moment I, people see traffic in Abuja, they know that invariably there are very few traffic manage managers at those points. Yeah. They do not trust that they will be able to get through. So their immediate thinking is, how do I get out of this to go and take an alternative route? And that's why it's very important for law and order to be a priority. And it's also important for traffic management to be a priority. When th there is uh, you know, any word whatsoever that there is a problem, either at you know, wherever it yeah, is that is happening, because... Right now, it's still not clear what has caused the situation. Um, there needs to be that awareness and a deployment to see how those bottlenecks can easily be sorted out. It's mm. no excuse for tardiness. Um, I mean, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, there are extraordinary circumstances. Yes, there's a lot of construction also happening around the city, but I think that there needs to be sufficient provision uh, made for uh, traffic management and also provision for alternative routes within you know, the, the other part is all those boys who handle the local government issues also on the road but well our guest uh, for this segment ha happens to be on the road and we have him joining us via zoom uh, mr abdulaziz adediron uh, popularly known as jandor thank you for joining us from a gov uh, governorship candidate of the people's democratic party in the 2023 elections for lagos thank you for joining us mr adediron Thank you very much for having me. Good morning. Uh, indeed. Yes, thank you for having me. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. So you, you're still on the road. How is it going out there? Sure. Well, uh, well yeah, um, it's in closer. I don't know. I think it blocked some roads, uh, actually, from the airport. Mm. Um, but I'm on the move. We do understand. But while you're on the move, we can still have this conversation as much as we can. So talk to us about this matter of internal party politics, some of the things that are going on within your party, sabotage, allegations of sabotage here and there. What's going on? Well, I actually don't think that um, the allegations, uh, because... We were all alive during the 2023 electionary process in Lagos State. Um, we had a um, situation where a supposed party leader, actually, I mean, he called channels and every other station, and he was everywhere uh, campaigning against this political party that nobody should vote for PDP, for whatever reason. Uh, he repeated the same uh, during the gubernatorial election. As a matter of fact, they openly declared for Labour Party. They hosted the Labour Party candidates as he, they had the press conference, uh, all the BOT members were there with him. And the party chairman also, uh, at the eve of the election, also came up with a release asking the people of Lagos and members of the party to go vote for Labour Party. So this were not allegations. They did it openly. They were on your station. 
Uh, the other person on your station, uh, the deputy governor, immediately after the election, while trying to justify, I mean, their winning, he said that, look, everybody left the party. Uh, he mentioned names. He mentioned Adedo Sumo. He mentioned the Jidwati, who was the PCC chairman. I said everybody left to join them. So, and, and that's it. So, without open declaration, uh, I don't think you still continue to call that an allegation because it's happened since then. This other person has not come out to say, no, the deputy governor was lying, even though they're open secret. So, um, as far as PDP is concerned in Lagos State, all these characters that I mentioned, they've openly declared for another party, uh, except they want to come back tomorrow, which is allowed in, in political uh, in politics, but you have to go back to your ward to rejoin the party. So, so but that, why, that actually why would, out. what the course, what would you say is behind all of this? Why would party leaders or people considered to be leadership in the party begin to speak or go contrary to the Tenet or the plans of the party 20, that they're 20, 2023 wasn't the first time that would happen in Lagos State, especially. Like, just like I said yesterday, it's been their stock in trade. Every election circle, uh, they will come to work against the party candidates. And um, uh, they did in 2015, they did in 2017 during local government election. They did same in 2019 you know, to declare for, uh, I mean, another party. And they do this not because they want the other party to win. They do it because they want APC to remain in power. You understand? Uh, yeah, you under so this, 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 they did every election cycle. As I was saying to uh, the other party members yesterday, they didn't do this because it was Jando. It has always been their style. That is it. And with this new trend now, they thought that just like every other governorship candidate, after they do that, they push them out of the party. You know, they did with Koro, they did it with Jimmy Abadje, and they'll push them and to continue ganging up again. But this time, Jando is staying. I'm not leaving for them. They are going to, they, they've left actually. So that is what we're speaking to. They can't, they won't succeed this time by pushing me away because that is what they do. The moment they do that, they push out the governorship candidate and they come back again doing the same thing over and over. Uh, so uh, that's, that's what we're speaking to now. So what precisely is your plan since you've decided to stay within the PDP in Lagos State? Just like I said yesterday, it's about time for us to now um, bring together like minds, those who are loyal to the party, those who believe in party supremacy, those who will stand irrespective of what happened to say, anyway, this is our party, we must support whoever that emerges as the candidate of the party because the person is not flying his own flag, but flying the flag of the party. Uh, so what we're trying to do now is, and we have started yesterday, how many of us that are really loyal with integrity to say, you know what, we go, because if, if, if the party at the national level want to again bring these people back or do anything to have them back, then who would take us serious if we come out to say we're still running or we're still member of a political party whose leadership went the other way around during the election? So, I mean, it, uh, but this time we're looking around and see those who are ready to work for the party genuinely and do everything to wrestle that power in Lagos. So uh, this is what we're doing. We have other loyal party members who's got integrity. Some have been there before now. Some of us just joined. And that is what we're, we're, we're doing this time. We're not, we're not going to leave. It does appear that you have an uphill task in your hand, uh, on your hands, because some people will say, look, the, the, the party in power, if they have received support of any kind from members of the PDP, of the opposition in, in the state, they're not going to let go of that support very easily. They will do everything in their power to make sure that the support is on their side. But in the meantime, people will be wondering, how is it that you, as a candidate, you know, in the last elections, how are you also keeping the current government on its own toes? Uh, well, um, uh, this is what I'm going to say. Election is over, okay? And whatever we speak to now, nobody should take it as us playing politics. 
I said it yesterday. Uh, it is time for governance. And if we do not get it right, whoever is there today, if he's not get it right, he's going to crash on all of us. Uh, just like what is happening right now in the country and everywhere. I was speaking to some of these things. Uh, where the, uh, I said yesterday that Mr. President is actually living his dream and we can't but be happy for him. God has put him there. But Nigerians also want to live their own dreams as well of enjoying good governance and all of that. And I've, all of us are here, we hear noise everywhere of hunger, high cost of living. These are facts. And the reason we are facing these are not facts. Because the Mr. President actually went to office uh, unprepared, let me use that word, with due respect. Because if for a very long time, um, he's been working towards occupying this office, I don't think the mistake made on day one uh, would have happened. Maybe he was only preparing to be in that office, but this is time for governors is already in the office. I said it yesterday. Uh, if I were Mr. President, I don't think I would go to my inauguration ground. The first thing I would do is to say subsidy is gone because the market started reacting to that. I thought the first thing to do if you're occupying such an office is to sit down and look at the handing over notes, you know, <clears throat> given to you or uh, living for you by your predecessor to look at one or two things. Even this subsidy of a pain, why didn't this guy remove the subsidy? Or what do we do before we can remove it? We're not saying don't do it. Or you wait until you have a cabinet, you sit with people and let's, guys, let's chill this. How do we go about it? If you can't wait till you have a cabinet, you can have a few, you know, advisory committee on economics to say, you know what, let's, let's sit down. And I also speak to what is happening today. Uh, they are going about with national minimum wage meeting in every geopolitical zone. These are things that we ought to have done before even removing the subsidy. We would have said, okay, in the next three months, four months, we are going to remove the subsidy. But before then, can we look at our national minimum wage? We can then take this meeting everywhere, arrive at somewhere. And the moment you are removing it, everybody is on the same page. But now, for one year now, you've removed subsidy, everything has gone up, and national minimum wage is still at 30,000. Who is going to cover for, even if you increase it to 100,000 tomorrow or more than that, who is going to make up for that one year? that everybody had to battle with high, high, high cost of living. And one of the approach they are even giving to this high cost of living, this palliative of a thing, I, I am not an apostle of palliative. It won't work. If you give me rice today, am I going to take the same rice to the pharmacy to buy drugs? Or am I going to use the same rice? To... So palliative won't work. Palliative, we, we can't reduce ourselves to this. Let the government do the needful by making sure that you, you increase the buying power of the people. If you give civil servants uh, enough money, the woman that is selling rice, that is selling this, we have enough money uh, to also restock. And I've also seen some reactions speaking to the fact that people who are selling markets are increasing their wares like on a daily basis. There's no how they won't do it. You know why? Because if you buy a ware for say 10 Naira, today, and you tend to sell for 12 Naira. And you're already hearing, you haven't sold it, but you, now you're hearing that it has gone to, the, at the factory, it has gone up to 15 Naira. You just have to increase your own, because if you sell at 12 Naira, you won't be able to restock. So that person is out of business. So these are the things that government need to look at and, and, and address and address this whole thing by making sure we do the need for, I think what we need to do is to press a reset button. Let Mr. President press a reset button. Let us go back to drawing board and let's let him seek for help. They, we don't expect you to know everything. We don't expect you to do everything. You are there so that you can source materials to work with, material that can assist you to work with. Let him let him look outward. Let him let him even look further inward mm. and what? surround himself with people who can assist him. Yes, you you've had a lawyer team for over two decades that you've been together. It is fine. But if you have tried them for six, seven, eight months, and they're not giving the re desired results, can you change them? You can still keep them and give them something else. Okay. We want you to succeed so that you don't crash on all of us. So you're looking at uh, national politics and national economy, which, I mean, which really is where all of the subnationals draw 
their own advantages and disadvantages from. Um, but, you know, you vied to be candidate or vied to be governor of Lagos State. I'm wondering if you have been looking more closely at what the uh, current governor of Lagos has, has been doing. In recent times, uh, we have heard two different sets of criticisms from other uh, candidates within the Lagos uh, space um, in terms of certain actions that the current governor has taken. Only recently, uh, after the red line was launched, I think we heard the criticism of the candidate of the Labour Party, you know, saying that, look, he thinks that credits really hasn't been given where it is due, and he gave his reasons. Uh, when the governor of Lagos was, was uh, said to have gone to Grenada, we also heard uh, the governor, beg your pardon, the yeah, governorship candidate of the ADC, Mr. Doherty, giving his own criticism and saying, you know, it is important for the governor to say on whose account uh, he was there and, you know, give a very detailed official account of what he went to do in Grenada if he was there on official duties. And if he wasn't there on official duties, it was important for him to have stated on whose funds um, he went to, to Grenada. Uh, so these are some of the things we have heard from the other candidates, but we haven't quite heard your voice uh, in local politics, apart from what's been happening within your party. Do you want to explain or, you know, give your thoughts on what's been happening in Lagos, or do you think that all is going according to plan? <clears throat> well, like I said, um, time to play politics is over, and that is not to say we don't have a duty of putting the government of the day on their tools. If, if, if they're not doing the needful. Uh, yes, of course, I, I was privy to all of this that you mentioned. And that for me, just like I put in my last press statement after the Supreme Court judgment, that, okay, we can cease fire. Let's allow him to, to govern. I believe that when it's time uh, for us to play politics, we bring out all of these dudes here uh, and, and, and put out there. But, you know, do, do you it's think there's other? Sorry to in, interrupt you, but do you think that these other candidates are playing? Is that what you're doing? Are they playing politics? No, 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 no. Or no, no, they're no, really no, calling no, no, issues no, to saying, light? No, 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 no. I'm not saying they are playing politics. No, like I said, uh, because of the position we occupy as, as an opposition, we still need to speak to one or two things. But for me, uh, just like I said, like I put in my last press statement, I, I saw. Um, a lot of things that they are trying to do in even approaching the high cost of living, even at the state level, which I've spoken to this issue of palliatives, it doesn't work for me. The last time he had his um, press um, statement or press briefing or whatever it is that he called it, he mentioned going to local government and be giving 1,000 people more put rights and things like that. And I look at it, I was like, what, 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 what is happening? But again, like I said, it when it's time for us to play this politics, we'll bring out all of this and say, look, in the last four years, this is the amount of money that has accrued to the state of Lagos. Like the issue of red line, uh, okay, fine. Finally, you brought us another three bus stop red line, okay? Um, and that is not what we're speaking to. When I was campaigning, I spoke to the fact that today, Lagos should be talking about uh, an integrated rail, rail system that will come from Mikunurugu and Itak in Nikeja. If you are going to Ireland, you go. If you are going to Ago, you go. But we are doing this two two bus stop rail line and we are celebrating it. It's okay. Let them, that is that is the best they can offer. It is fine. Okay. And what, what we possibly do? When we get there, we then teach them how to do this thing better. So for me, uh, of course, I know things. I'm not working on well, but I just don't want to look like, oh, are we going to be playing politics all the time? When is that time we speak to it? But I've not seen uh, something for me to come out and say I should be speaking to. Uh, that That is why I haven't joined. And after this whole thing, if you remember, Malpe, I took time off my personal work to join the process. I am not a professional politician. I'm just a professional in politics. So I had to first go back to resuscitate my business, focus on it. Then when I get, I stabilize a bit, then I come to, you know, to say, okay, let's start speaking to things because nobody's going to pay my dues. Nobody's going to pay my bills. So I, I can't just sit down and be playing politics like 247. I've got something doing that all of you know it will be fine before joining the process. So this time, um, what I had yesterday was my first political well, 
And that was just for me to appeal. That worked tirelessly for us. You remember we ran campaign like never before in Lagos. And we're on national TV every day, on channels, on Arise, you know, telling people of Lagos what we represent, what we're ready to offer. And I need to thank those people that had sleepless nights. We were attacked everywhere in Lagos. And thank God we're alive. So that was what I did yesterday. And that was my first political... Just to say that, okay, it was to leave so that they can continue with their usual trade, you know, in PDP. You know, Mr. Adediron, as you said, yes, the politicking is over, it's time for governance. So going forward, what, would, what should we expect to see from you? Of course, I'll, I'll be speaking to policies that I feel are not masses friendly or people friendly from anywhere. I mean, I will speak to it just to... Um, because I just want to castigate or I want to know. We'll see how we can also offer an advice. They don't have to take it and say, what if we do it this way? What if we, or this is what we would have done differently? By so doing, they can pick one or two things and use. Like I said, they are governing us today. If you do not support them or find a way to flip in something to them, they will crash on all of us. And that would be a disaster before it's then time for politics. So this is what I'm speaking to. It's not just all the time I'll come and say, you must down, I must pull you down. No, you have your office for four years. We've gone through the court. Nothing has happened. So enjoy your four years, but we'll try to let you see that, look, your policy is affecting us, is affecting our business. You need to do this, or this is what we would have done differently. We won't just do it just to come and criticize for the sake of it. No, we will see how we can prefer solution because the, he's the governor today. The other one is the president today. We don't have any choice. We have to live with that for another four years. Mm. All right. Thank, so, you. Thank you so much. What, what we'll do is to see how we can say, okay, this is what we can ship in. This is how we can and look at it. Not all the time we have to say we must pull you down. Thank you so much, Mr. Abdulaziz. When it's time for election, for politics, we go, we go all out for each other. All right. I think we'll have to leave it there this time. Thank you so much, Mr. Ad Abdulaziz Adediron. Jan Dor, a governorship candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Lagos, in the 2023 elections. Thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you very much, Jan. And we, it does appear that the traffic ensured you didn't make it to the studio. Mark, mm -hmm. <laughs> but at least you made it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the show for today. I want to thank you so much for letting us be a part of your morning. We thank you for your messages, those that have come in and the ones that were still waiting for them to drop. Also, Looks as if the internet is not helping issues as well. But again, thank you so much. Until we bring you another package of the show tomorrow, I'm Neil Taibwe. Thank you for being a part of the program this morning. And do not let anything ruin your week or your Monday. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. Especially traffic. And I think, you know, the, the FCT administration should speak to the people to know what exactly, so they know what is happening and what to expect. Amaya Makinde, do have a wonderful day.